It is good to be here tonight and uh, pardon me for being a little nervous for several reasons. Yes, one, because the Lord just changed my message and that's not very comfortable, especially when you don't preach in your own language. Uh, I bring you greetings from the Southern Grace Baptist Assembly of Boksha, Romania, the church that I pastor, from many brothers and sisters all over Romania and not only from Germany and from other countries in Europe but also from uh, Brother Curtis Pugh and a number of other um, um, brethren uh, here. And I'm sorry I don't want to leave anyone out, so I'll just <laughs> say that. Uh, you don't know how blessed you are here. And it's so easy to take some things for granted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I say this in every church I've been in. The very fact that you have sister churches, right, that you can fellowship with. You don't know how big a blessing that is. Right. Uh, the closest church we can fellowship with is at the other corner of Europe, the western ex extremity, in uh, Cork, Ireland. That's the only one that we know of. And we tried to find others in many, many countries, because we go in many countries of Europe. We just didn't. Europe is dark, right? And we are thirsty and hungry for fellowship. We don't want to compromise and lower the standard of truth. But you are so blessed. Amen. Yeah. And um, I wish that all our people would be aware of this privilege and, and blessing. I want to bring a message to you tonight. And after that, I'll try to be as short as I can. I don't know uh, how much time do I have. But every day, I won't. That's dangerous. <laughs> to tell me that because in Romania, when I'm on these mission trips, we meet whenever we get there. And sometimes it's midnight or one in the morning. <laughs> and you know, I feel that everyone is just worn out. Um, well, I'm not going to keep you that long. But first, I would like to share a few thoughts with you from the Bible, and then I will tell you a little bit about the work we're doing there um, in Romania. I'd like to preach to you tonight on the subject, the faith of God's elect. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to preach to you about something else, and as far as I know, there were no doctrinal errors in the message, but the Lord really <laughs> impressed this message on me. Actually, I was just writing my notes down. I didn't finish when Brother Larry came to pick me up, so I asked if I could print <laughs> the notes here, <laughs> or else I would have just given you half a message. Uh, in uh, the epistle that our Apostle Paul addressed to Titus, in verse 1, chapter 1, he says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. Apostle Paul specifically calls the faith by this name. But this description, the faith of God's elect. Mm -hmm. Now, the very notion of election excludes the fact that all men are elected, because otherwise right. there would be no election, right? Right. So, an election implies a selection. Some are chosen, some are left. Right. Yeah. So, the, the faith of God's elect speaks of something special, something that only one portion of humanity has. So, about this subject I would like to talk with you tonight. And uh, first of all, we need to ask ourselves, what is faith? Well, we know from uh, Hebrews chapter 11, a kind of a definition of faith. Where in verse 1 we read that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not See. So what is faith? From this verse and the whole passage, the whole chapter, we learn that faith is a total confidence and trust in uh, the Lord, Amen. in His Word. And it Im implies, it involves loyalty and fidelity in the object of our faith, which is God. Uh, Faith, in a sense, and we find this in, uh, in this sense in the Bible, is a mental or intellectual acknowledgement or 
agreement to some statements, which we call teachings or doctrines. But it's more than that. Uh, it is also a strong inward trust. Amen. In the one who makes those statements, in the one about whom the statements are made. Uh, faith implies, therefore, a relationship with the one in whom I believe. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the purpose of faith? Many people think that faith is my part in accepting the offer of God. Therefore, uh, by faith I am saved and faith is my contribution to salvation. That's wrong. You're right. Faith, as someone, someone uh, illustrated it like this, faith is not a full hand giving something to God, my contribution, but it's an empty hand receiving. Amen. Faith Amen. is the instrument by which I appropriate for, my, for myself the message of the Gospel. Mm -hmm. Faith is the instrument, not the cause of my salvation. It is the instrument by which salvation is brought to me. Uh, in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we find an interesting but hard statement there. Mm -hmm. For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, right. not of works, lest any man should boast. Right. Now, if I can contribute to my salvation with anything, if, I, if God just offers me salvation, and then it's my part to take it or leave it, if God makes one step toward me, or 99 steps toward me, if I make one step toward Him, you know, that's salvation by works. You're right. Amen. Uh, we don't, in salvation, God doesn't share uh, His glory. That's right. Um, uh, and it's not like stock, sh uh, sh uh, share stock. How do you call it here? Stock. Yeah, the stock. It's, salvation is not like that. You're right. Where God has. 50 plus 1 percent and we have the rest of well, God has 99 percent and we have 1 percent. No, salvation is 100 percent of the Lord. He's Amen. An Omega yeah. in it. So this is faith, but it is the gift of God. And this is not a singular passage in the New Testament that speaks of faith as being given to men. In Philippians, Chapter 1, verse 29, we read something similar. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Persecution. <coughs> right. Suffering. In His name, for His sake. is grace. It is given to you. It is a privilege. It is an honor. Amen. But, just like... It is given to some to suffer for Christ. Apostle says, it is given to you to believe on Him. So it doesn't come of yourself, out of yourselves. Salvation, uh, faith is not our product. Amen. It is not something that lies in every man and it's activated somehow by the preaching of the Gospel. You know, that's not saving faith. The Apostle Peter in, in 2 Peter 1 1 speaks of uh, uh, faith, precious faith that is obtained. Right? Mm -hmm. So if it's obtained, if it's given, that's the meaning of the word, it's not mine. Right. It doesn't come from my heart, my state of being, my nature. Right. Now, uh, why is it that God needs to impart, to give us as a gift, faith? Well, because saving faith, the faith of God's elect, is not there to begin with. That's why He has to intervene and give it. Uh, but this is strange because men, the humans, by nature, they are predisposed, they are 
inclined toward religion. They are inclined mm -hmm. toward right. believing in something. Yeah. When you look at this universal spread of religion, you see man is a worshipper by nature. He is inclined to believe in something. Right. What about the atheists? They say, we don't believe. That's false. That's a misstatement. Actually, they need faith. Two, they don't have all um, the knowledge in the universe to make the statement, I know for sure that God doesn't exist. You know, how much knowledge do we have? Not even 1%. It's point. I don't know how many zeros and 1% of the whole possible knowledge in the universe. And how can we then make certain, I mean, sure statements that we know that God doesn't exist? No, we don't. You're Not right. even the atheists can say that. <clears throat> they, their system is based on faith. Well, what about all the philosophical systems in the world? They start with certain premises that have to be accepted by faith. Well, what about science? Now, science is usually considered uh, as uh, the opposite to faith. But it's actually not so. Even, I mean, every science, every system, scientific system, it's actually based on faith. Things that you cannot prove but take for granted, and from there you build on. Right. What about geometry? We talked a little about geometry. Well, in geometry you have uh, axioms. Everything rests on axioms. You know what an axiom is? It is something considered true, generally true, with no exception, but that you cannot prove. <laughs> All right. So you see, everything in this world is, to a certain degree, based on faith. Yeah. Well, if natural man has faith, and we see that in the religions around us, then how come the Bible talks about the faith of God's elect, and the faith that is given to us when we, in our natural state, we have some sort of faith. And you know something? That faith, the natural faith, goes a long way. We think that our, our faith is so strong and special for uh, even dying for it. But guess what? There are people that die for the wrong religions. Right. Wrong Amen. Right? Some people blow themselves up. You know, expecting to go in a heaven full of virgins. And they have strong enough faith to die for it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, how is it that God imparts, gives this faith as a gift when we are all believers by nature? Well, let's see the difference. But what are the differences between the natural belief, the natural faith of man, and God-given faith? Amen. And then we shall see that man cannot produce, cannot reach the faith, the saving faith, the faith of God's elect. And this is why we are saved by God's grace. Mm -hmm. And we just have nothing to brag about, nothing to boast. Uh, why is the natural faith not good enough to save anyone? Well, first, because man in his natural state, the way we come into this world, our nature, our flesh, the Bible calls it, is enmity mm -hmm. against God. That's what we find in Romans 8, 7. Our very, and all our inclinations, they're enmity, they clash with whatever God demands for us. It's just the opposite. So that the flesh cannot submit, does not want, and cannot submit to the law of God. Amen. You're right. This is why a natural faith will never bring one person to God. Right. Secondly, because the natural man considers the message of God to be a nonsense, to be a fairy tale. To be foolishness, mm -hmm. right? This is what uh, Paul speaks about in uh, Second, in First Corinthians two fourteen, that the spiritual things are foolishness. Mm -hmm. 
to the natural them. He cannot receive them. He considers them foolish. Well, what does that mean? Uh, we sang a, a, a song, I think the first song we sang, I, I wrote down the, a part of uh, a verse. Uh, For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. Amen. But how come? All of a sudden, everything that we love, you know, we consider folly, folly, foolishness. Because natural men, in our natural state, we love sin. Right. And we hate God. And all of a sudden, what we consider foolishness, which is the way of salvation, the preaching of Christ and Him crucified, what, what was foolishness, all of a sudden we embrace. Amen. And what we considered, you know, the greatest pleasure and the desire of our life, which is the, the sin, we consider foolishness. So, what happened? It's not something... It's not a leap that we made in our natural state. God intervened and changed our inclinations, Amen. changed our dispositions, changed our nature. Amen. And that by 180 degrees. Why cannot, can, uh, why natural faith cannot bring anyone to God? Because man is spiritually dead. Ephesians 2, 1. Dead in trespasses and sins. That means that we absolutely cannot respond to relating to God. The spiritual part of man is that part of us that can know and relate mm -hmm. to God. To love Him. But we're dead. And unless and until God brings life where is death, no man in his natural condition will produce any response to the calling of the gospel. And there is another reason, or reason why the uh, natural faith cannot save anyone, because faith is always connected with repentance. Amen. They're never separated. Actually, they are twin gifts. I just read or mentioned several verses that speak about faith as God-given, God-wrought in us. While there are other verses that speak about repentance as being the gift of God, as something that He works in His people. They are twin gifts. We cannot talk about a believer, an unrepentant believer, right, or a repentant unbeliever. There's no such thing. Both of them come and they stand or fall together. Well, Amen. what is repentance? Many people have wrong ideas about repentance. Repentance is not just sorrow. You know, to, to feel sorry for your condition or for your sins. No, repentance is more than that. The, uh, the uh, right kind of sorrow will lead one to repentance. But repentance literally means a change of mind. It means a change of worldview, if I can call it like that. A change of all my values. This is why what I loved before, now I consider folly. And what I considered foolishness before, now I consider the power of God unto salvation. That's repentance. Amen. And this cannot be produced by the natural man. Right. And cannot be produced by faith in a natural state. No. It has to be given by God. Amen. Well, what are the differences between the natural faith and God-given faith? First, the object of saving faith is the God of the Bible. We look at Him. We, we look at Lord Jesus. That's the first thing when God regenerates us through His Spirit, when we hear the Gospel and, and, and He works in us in an effectual, ma effectual manner, it is like we open our eyes for the first time. Right. When we look at us, we see our sinfulness. And then, and our hopelessness. We stand guilty as charged before the holy and just God. But then, that's the bad news, part of, part of the good news that's bad. 
<laughs> but then is the good news. When we have no chance to redeem ourselves or to gain God's favor, the Lord shows us Christ. Amen. To be everything, to have done everything, to have paid the entire price. The Amen. That, that we, could, we could never pay in the whole eternity. Amen. So we just, when we open our eyes, we see Him. Now, that's saving faith. The object of the saving faith is the God of the Bible. Now, the natural man will worship anyone but the God of the Bible. Is this true? They would be ready to worship animals and insects sure. and all kinds of natural forces, anything, Mother Nature, mm -hmm. but the God of the Bible. Right. Now they are ready to accept any kind of religion, doesn't matter how nonsensical it may be, but the revealed truth of God. Why? Because they hate the God of the Bible. You're right. Many people that consider themselves Christians, you know, or believing in the God of the Bible, they actually believe in a notion of the Bible, of the God of the Bible. Right. Amen. Not in Him uh, altogether. They may like certain traits, like God is love, mm -hmm. right? God is merciful, and He is. Amen. But he is just. Amen. And the sinful man doesn't like that. Right. And he is holy. Right. Yeah. He is separated from sin. He is separated from the world. Separated from everything that is evil. Men don't like that. You're right. So they like their own notion about God. Sort of like this, uh, you know, a tolerant and loving and long-suffering God that keeps knocking at the door, you know, that has a doorknob or a handle only on the inside. That's not the God of the Bible. You're right. Many people would claim to believe in Jesus and the God of the Bible, but actually they believe only in their perspective, their imagination right. of that God. Well, in respect to the quality of our faith, of the faith of God's elect, saving faith is an inward trust that involves a relationship with the one in whom you believe. The key word is relationship. You know, we can believe certain statements, doctrinal statements. We can believe a confession of faith and be lost. You're right. Amen. We can believe you know, the truth. We can believe facts about Jesus Christ. We can believe that He is the Son of God and agree mentally with this. We can believe that 2,000 years ago He died. Right. And three days later He was resurrected. Yeah. And still be lost. You're right. Yeah. Because if we don't have a faith that produces a living relationship with that Jesus, with that God, you know, that's just mental mm -hmm. faith. It's dead faith. You know, I believe in the multiplication table. <laughs> right. And we better believe it too. You know, but I have no relationship with that table. Right. Amen. You know, these are just principles, just statements that, you know, leave me cold. Right. Amen. You know, I can believe in certain statements about President Trump or President Putin, or Angela Merkel, or my president in Romania. But I have no relationship with them. And I don't think I missed anything. <laughs> but, you know, faith is not just a mental agreement. It's more than mental agreement and acknowledgement of certain statements. I'm afraid that many people that are in churches today, that's all they have. Right. right, a mental agreement. They, they they agree with all the statements of the confession of faith or the church covenant, but there is no life. There is no reality. Day to day walk with Jesus, relationship with our God. Right. Now that's what saving faith produces. Mm -hmm. Amen. Fruits and works. You're right. Otherwise, what makes us different? What makes the church of our Lord different than the? multitudes of other kinds of churches around us. 
is it just a doctrinal statement? That should be the very minimum. You're right. We live differently. We experience God differently than the rest. Because the truth that we know, what do we do with it? Keep it in books? No, we live it. Amen. And the more truth you know, the closer you can get to God. That's the advantage of being part of one of the Lord's churches. The truth was not given to us just to increase our mental knowledge. You know, sometimes I feel like we're like caricatures, you know, with big heads and very small bodies. <laughs> That's not why truth was given to us. You're right. We should live it and it should help us in our daily walk with Christ. Faith, saving faith, the faith of God's elect is the kind of faith that is living, that produces works, that can be seen through its works. You know, our life experience with God, our, our walk with Him is illustrated in the Bible as the growth mm -hmm. of a child. We have here a two-week-old baby, right? Mm -hmm. You know, up to maturity. It starts with the uh, regeneration, which is the birth, the second birth. You know, and we are infants, we are newborn babies when we come into this world. We open our eyes for the first time and then we grow and grow and grow. Well, in our growth, not just the head, mm -hmm. you know, right. in our growth, something happens. We become more and more alike with our Father and with our oldest brother. Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if that likeness is not seen in us, what is it that we have? Now, just a mental faith. Mm -hmm. uh, we sang the song and I wrote it down to trust and obey. There is a direct link between saving faith and obedience. Uh, natural faith does not produce total obedience, total trust. Does not. Uh, what happens is that even when we have people that make professions of faith, and this is great to see someone making a profession of faith, it's such a blessed thing. Mm -hmm. Amen. But, there are people that make professions of faith and, you know, they are just uh, very enthusiastic at first, but then you see that faith fading away. Mm -hmm. Well, saving faith is not like that. Saving faith, the faith of God's elect, continues. It does not wash away, it does not fade away, it does not disappear, you know, but on the contrary, when the more we walk with God, the more we believe with in Him, you know, the deeper you know, our faith is, the stronger Amen. our faith is, the more beautiful our relationship with God in our everyday life is. It's always fresh. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think I ever got bored since the Lord saved me. You sent me a message today asking if I got bored. No, I did not. And I never, since the Lord saved me, I, there wasn't a single second that I got bored. Because believing in Him and believing His Word is fascinating. Amen. You know, every... And this is not my subject, but I challenge several churches, if not all that I preached in now, uh, in the States, and I want to challenge you too. Every single day, I challenge myself first to bring thanks to the Lord for one new thing. One new thing every day. Besides the other things that I thank the Lord for, one new thing every day. Now think about it. First I thought, at one point I will run out you know, of ideas. You know, it has been years since I began doing that, and I never ran out. Because the more you look around 
to see God at work and to give him to give uh, to find reasons for which to thank him the more reasons you find amen all things work together for the good of those that love God but most of the things we don't even notice and isn't that sad mm -hmm. we only notice the, the things that really make an impact in our life the big ones but God works in little details too and we miss them because we don't pay attention well, I invite you to pick up this challenge and try to give the Lord thanks for one Amen. new thing every day and you'll see how our prayer life is changed by this very little thing. Now, don't do what I did once. I thought about two new things to thank the Lord. And I, in my flesh, thought I'm going to leave one for tomorrow. You know, and then I said, no, that's wrong. You know, I'm going to give thanks to the Lord for two new things today. And I'm going to trust tomorrow and find, find another new one. <laughs> and I did. Amen. Well, back to, to the message. The faith of God's elect grows in time. And I wish I could tell you that it grows constantly. It doesn't. There are times that the pace is slower. It's times like we feel like we're walking in knee-deep mud and it's difficult to move forward. But something somehow happens. We always move forward. Why? Because we're not alone. It's not just up to us. It is He that carries us. It is Amen. He that draws us. So the faith of God's elect is always Increasing, There's always a progression, a perseverance in it. I said about people that are enthusiastic at first. And they seem to have a sentiment of religion. And you look at them and you say, wow, I wish I would be like them. But then all of a sudden they fall. Right. What happened? Well, for, for many, you know, they can, come, they can have a religious experience. That would be sort of, I, I call it like a, a defibrillator. Mm. Yes, yeah. you know, and they, they get in a state of emotion, you know, and you see some, you know, movement, you see there's some heart activity, but it's still spiritual death. Mm. Well, that should be a challenge to every one of us. Am I alive? You know, do I have the faith of God's elect? Well, it, uh, saving faith is not the answer of the natural man to the offer that God makes in the Gospel. Uh, even though we have, as natural beings, we have our predisposition to believe, saving faith is more than that. Amen. Uh, when somebody repents and believes, that is because God worked in that person's heart and placed there the gift of repentance and faith. How can I know that I have the faith of God's elect? Well, first I should understand what faith really consists of. And there's several, many times we find in the New Testament the word faith associated with uh, different things, like uh, understanding the message. I mean, to, to one point, faith is understanding the message. And this is important, why? Because if I don't understand the message, if I believe something wrong, that won't produce salvation. Right. Now, if I believe that Jesus died, but he died just to set an example, or he died just a martyr, will my belief in his death produce salvation? No, because I have to believe in his Atoning death. Mm -hmm. Amen. I have to believe something <laughs> specific about his death. He didn't die just to set an example or because he, he was just mistreated. No, it was more than that. He was the fulfillment of God's plan. And all the types and shadows of the Old Testament were pointing at him. Amen. So I have to believe the truth. Well, I have to understand the truth first. And, and this means something else, that where there is no preaching of the truth, there is no salvation. You're right. This is why we need to go out and preach the gospel. Amen. 
Because without the gospel, there is no chance of salvation. So much for people that say that God offers all men an equal chance to believe or not, to take salvation or leave it. Or leave it. That's false. You're right. It's yeah, a yeah. nonsense. And you know why? Because many people died before Christ came and never had a chance to hear about Him. Many people died, died after Him without ever having a chance to believe on Him. So what about them? They were never given the chance to take salvation or leave it. No. They were not. The fact that you were born in a place and in a time where God brought you in contact with the gospel, that's a great blessing. Amen. If you, Amen. Were, if you would have been born 600 years ago, the very same day, the very same month, but 600 years ago, in the same place, would you have heard, would you have heard the gospel? No. Yeah. No. And the people that were born here on the same day and the same month, but 600 years ago, they were lost. They died lost. They died without Jesus. Amen. You're right. So Amen. it's no coincidence. I was born in communist Romania. Yeah. But still the Lord brought me in touch with the gospel. Amen. And He does it with every single person that He appointed or ordained unto salvation. You know, it's no little thing that, that we have the gospel, that we have the truth. Without the preaching of the gospel, without the name of Jesus being proclaimed, there's no salvation. Because there's no other name given unto heaven. In which we are saved, right? Amen. Understanding the message of salvation is the first part of saving faith. If I believe in something, if I don't understand it, if I believe in, in something wrong, that, not, that doesn't produce salvation. Many preach a diluted gospel. Right. Many preach a totally false gospel. Well, it's a danger. Some, some preachers seem to want to <coughs> compromise a little for popularity's sake. The gospel is the power of God. Amen. Not the schemes, not the programs, not the um, um, skills of the preacher. It is the gospel that is the power of God. And that Amen. message but must not be compromised at any cost. Because it is the, the only message this produces salvation. Men make counterfeits. They don't produce salvation. Yes, God may save some people out there, but in spite of the message preached, in spite of the means used, just because the word is read mm -hmm. and the word is truth and has power, even in spite of misinterpretations. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, the second part of, uh, of uh, saving faith is recognizing the truthfulness of the message. Every time the gospel is preached, it divides people in two classes. And only two classes. Those that believe it, and those that do not. Amen, you're right. There's no middle ground here. Those that believe it, they are saved, their sins are forgiven, and those that do not believe it, whatever excuse, whatever confusion they may be in, they still remain in their sins. Amen. There are only two possible categories here. And the gospel divides them. You believe it or you don't believe it. Well, the, first, the second part of uh, the saving faith is believing the truthfulness of the message. And then thirdly, saving faith is not merely mental understanding. It's not uh, just acknowledging certain statements. Right, amen. It is the trust, the inward trust, the casting of yourself totally upon the message and upon the object of the message, which is Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it, many people just understand the facts. Many people just think, you know, they acknowledge them to be true, just as I mentioned. They would agree with every statement of a confession of faith and still be lost. Why? Because there's no living faith. There is no trust, no relationship with the God 
in whom they say they believe. Uh, when we believe savingly, our life is changed. Mm -hmm. We are never the same. Amen. Never. And you know something? We would never want to be the same. We would never want that change in us to be reversed. Uh -huh. I hear many people say, especially in Romania, where Armenians believe that you can lose your salvation, that yes, we are in God's hand and nobody can pluck us out from, his, from uh, the Father's hand, but I can go out if I want to. <laughs> Do you really want to? I mean, is that even an option for a child of God? Would, for anything in this world, would I want the change that was wrought in me to be reversed? No way. Amen. A, a true child of God that experienced saving faith would never want to go back to the place he was brought out of. Uh, James speaks about a, a living faith, one that produces works. As I said earlier, a living faith separates us from the world. You know, many people prefer to look at the world as a standard, kind of look back, mm -hmm. you know. As long as I'm a, a bit better than those of my generation, I should be okay. Well, guess what? The Lord didn't leave us here to be a little better than the average. Amen. He left us here to be transformed and conformed to the image of His Son. So Amen. it's not enough just to look backward and be satisfied that I'm three steps ahead of the world. My eyes should be focused Amen. on our Lord. Yeah. And our process of transformation is it, it is a process of sanctification. Amen. There is a sense in which we are holy, consecrated, separated from the world unto God that doesn't know degrees. You're either holy or you're not. You're saved or you're not. But there is a process of transformation. Mm -hmm. And that's a day-to-day -day process. Right. We are called to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know the measure we are filled with the Holy Spirit? Is the measure in which we are emptied from our flesh. Amen. That's the measure. Isn't it sad that we sometimes just grab and won't let go to the things of this world? God calls us to be holy. Amen. How holy? <laughs> What's the standard? Well, He is the standard. If you didn't experience this faith, I encourage you to come to God. One man came to Jesus once and, and he said, Lord, help my unbelief. Right. And he never cast away, never rejected anyone that came to him. All us should search ourselves and, and come to a conclusion. Do I have the faith of God's elect? Not just the religion, not just the mental acknowledgement of truth, but that trust that we live in relationship with Him. Because that's what saves. Amen. Religion doesn't save. Even the right doctrine doesn't save. You're right. God saves. And we have to cast our whole hope and our whole life on him at his and at his feet our aim should be to be like him let every day and every circumstance uh, be worked in your life as god's manifestation of the riches of his glorious grace that is the faith of god's elect that it's lived on a daily basis. May the Lord bless you all. Thank you. Amen. 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 Well, I was longer than I first thought. I apologize for that. No, go ahead. But I still was shorter than I would have been in Romania. So I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> Alright, just a few things about uh, the work there. Uh, and it's it's hard to know where to start. Well, our church was organized in 2009, but I was baptized by Brother Curtis in 2002. I was the first person that he baptized in Romania after he came. And it was a long story how the Lord brought me 
in touch with him, but I'll just say this, it's Romans 8.28. <laughs> All things work together. And when uh, Brother Curtis came to Romania in a time where I just was recently saved and trying to make sense of uh, predestination and of uh, the doctrine of grace without knowing about them. Right. And, and the assurance of salvation, the Lord worked it in such a way that Brother Curtis came halfway around the world, you know. Amen. Moved to the village next to my town. <laughs> just for me. Amen. Well, we started meeting in uh, 2002. It was just the three at us at first, and then there were other people that joined. Uh, when we started printing, the, the printing work, and bought our first equipment, still most of the work uh, was manual. <clears throat> right now, we praise the Lord that we have a lot of automatic uh, print shop equipment. But in the first year, we printed 10,000 booklets. And that, we thought, it was amazing. You know, because we were distributing them. Amen. Well, the next year, we printed 19,000. So, it was almost double. And still, we just couldn't believe that, you know, just a few people could do that and distribute. And the next year, it was 27,000. Amen. Well, right now, it's, we're about 100,000 per year. Amen. And they're all going out. I mean, they're out there. And uh, six years ago, when I came to the States, I was telling the churches that we were able to print like one book per year with great efforts. In the meantime, we were able to print 20 books. And uh, right now we're about at a little over 60,000 books printed. Amen. And uh, we're getting close to 1 million publications. And this is just three people that work full-time in the print shop. It's uh, my brother Joe, Aurel, and my wife Miriam, and myself. And it's actually most of two of them, because I work as a translator, as an editor, I prepare the materials for them to be translated, to be printed. So it's a lot of work. We're kind of burning the candle at both ends, but we're privileged to be at, uh, in, uh, you know, used as God's instruments in uh, this work. But well, regarding the materials, uh, what do we do with them? <laughs> uh, we printed like about 400,000 pieces of uh, gospel booklets that have been distributed not only in Romania, but in other countries too. We believe in going with the gospel out. Amen. Uh, we believe that the mission, the Great Commission, uh, means that we must not enclose ourselves within some walls and expect lost people to come visit us or to hear the gospel. You're right. They're Amen. not going to come. Our mission is to be out there. So for us, actually, the meetings of the church are mostly for worship and for teaching. Amen. And, Amen. The, and, the, and the preaching of the gospel is for the outside. And we do that on a daily basis. And it's amazing how much a small church can do on a daily basis. When I ask the church to compile, just give me some numbers uh, to put together, I thought, surely there, there is an error somewhere. But it was not. Uh, we covered from door to door more than 110 villages. Uh, five towns of up to 20,000. Amen. One city of 300,000. It took us two years for that. And right now we are uh, two cities in progress. One of them is the capital city, Bucharest, which has four million uh, people, uh, two million residents and uh, two more workers and students and people that come in and go out. And we started last year this mission uh, work in Bucharest and the Lord has been blessing it in spite of fierce opposition from the devil. Uh, we had our first roots baptized Amen. Uh, in uh, June, there are more in, uh, once I go back to Romania. And uh, it is hard work, but it's also such a blessing. It is the greatest honor that one can, can uh, have after salvation is to be used by the Lord in, uh, in uh, expanding His kingdom. And there's a work for everyone. We have a saying in Europe, an old uh, Baptist saying every Baptist a missionary. Amen. 
you know, uh, our gifts, each one is different. And just, you know, a few, just a few gifts will put us in front of the church, you know, to speak, to teach, to preach. But all of us must share the gospel. Because we will reach in circles that the preacher doesn't. Amen. And if we do that on a daily basis, if it's part of our life, it is amazing what the Lord can do. Amen. You know, it is, it, it's not that He couldn't do it without us. We're not irreplaceable. You know, but it is a wonderful means that He, he uh, chose to use His people. Now, when we go on a mission trip, because there are people that are in touch with us, close to us, learning grace and church all over Romania. It sometimes takes us 10, to, 10 days to 2 weeks to come back home. And I mean, that's a mission trip planned at half an hour increments. So constantly on the run. People meet with us whenever we get uh, there. And uh, it's difficult to reach them. Many of them, because our literature is distributed by so many now, not just by us and the people closer to us, even by Armenians, by Union Baptist churches. And many that were saved through the literature, they're still part of those churches. But we're confident that when time comes, God's time comes, He will call them out. Right. Uh, we're in touch with uh, very uh, many, but still we're just a small uh, church. But we want to be consistent in uh, not compromising the truth and going out with the gospel. Uh, the literature work uh, expanded to a point where we're not only sending you know, uh, packages all over Romania, but also uh, in the entire Europe. And I made several mission trips to other countries, including Republic of Moldova, which is east of us, Ukraine, uh, Brother Larry was once with Brother Kenny in Ukraine. The following year, I accompanied Brother Kenny, and we made in, we made the trip to another place there. Uh, in uh, many trips to Germany, we made to Austria, to Italy, uh, even to the, uh, to Rome, um, and we're still expected in a lot of other countries that we just never got to go, like England and, and Spain and uh, Belgium. So, the the literature is going out, and we stay, uh, we stay in touch uh, with these people that are coming along, they're learning. Uh, once a year, and now twice a year, we have Bible conferences, which are teaching conferences. And uh, most of, uh, I mean, the usually the closest people to us, they, uh, you know, we invite them to come. We can't invite too many because we have limited uh, budget and limited space. But uh, uh, every conference was a real blessing. And after almost everyone, there were people that came forth and wanted to be baptized. Um, so we're thankful to have this printing work. I've seen the importance of printing work on and on, not just in Romania looking at how many people call us mm -hmm. but also in Peru when I was last year where they have no literature so to, to them it was amazing like to give a booklet to a lost person a gospel booklet not just to preach to them to leave something behind for them it was extraordinary right and we are blessed to be able to do this you know free of charge and and, and at this amount we kind of reached the top right now because you can do only so much with uh, uh, a budget uh, and it's hard to keep in print all all these publications now and move on and translate uh, others but uh, many are available just in electronic format waiting in line whenever we'll have money to print them and we also translated materials not only I mean we're printing right now in four languages uh, Romanian, English, Russian, and German, and we're ready to print in uh, Spanish too, and also we're close to printing in French, but right now there is not a big demand in French. So, um, we translated gospel and church truth and grace materials into 11 European languages. So, we started receiving requests and feedback all over the internet from all over Europe and actually all over the world. Amen. 
so again, it's amazing what a little church can do, not by its own strength. Again, when I look at us, I say, you know, you know, praise the Lord. I, I, I still think there are some errors there in the figures, but I'm not sure that they're not. You know, but it's a hard work. Sometimes we work consistently, I mean, day after day, up to 15 hours. And at one point, uh, it will come to us. It will reach us. <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, we were just thankful and enthusiastic and, and just excited about being part of uh, that work. So, if you wish, we would really appreciate your prayers for us. It is a blessing to know that sister churches are, you know, with us there, you know, praying because with, with whenever the Lord is working. You know, the devil is not idle either. Right. Amen. So every time we started the new mission work, every time we were uh, advancing, we were hit hard. Right. And uh, in the last couple of years, it was like, if we get a week of tranquility, it is like, you know, pull yourself together because something big is coming. <laughs> <laughs> but the Lord pulled us through in, in so many wonderful ways and taught us to totally depend on Him, on Amen. Him day after day. And that's a precious uh, lesson to learn. That no matter how wise you are, no matter how strong, no matter how strong your faith is, it all amounts actually to God perfecting you. Amen. Working through you. So, you know, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for uh, having me here. And I assure you that we are praying for you. And uh, keep up the word. The word of the gospel is our banner. And follow Christ and fulfill the great commission. Amen. Here, right out there when you open the doors, that's your mission field. Amen. You know, that's your Jerusalem. You know, your county and then Tennessee, you know, is your Judea. Amen. Right? That's it. Well, can I say the South is Samaria? <laughs> it doesn't sound good. <laughs> but you know what I mean. And and be faithful in uh, doing that. We want to know, and we're praying for you, and we want to know that the Lord's churches here are, are faithful in doing the Great Commission work here. Amen. Uh, there, are many, there are many churches, several churches that support us, but I told every one of them. And it may sound, I don't know, strange, but um, if we, we were afraid that some churches uh, thought that fulfilling the Great Commission was just supporting a foreign missionary or a foreign mission work. And I told, you know, if, you know, we don't want your money. Right. If, if you think by that that you fulfill the Great Commission, you know, you are disobedient. Amen. You're right. You have to start with your Jerusalem and be consistent for the Lord to bless your acts of sacrifice. So we encourage you to be faithful in what the Lord entrusted you Amen. With, uh, here. And our prayers are with you. And please remember us in your prayers over there in your Amen. Amen. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Amen, brother. That's the lesson.